Morning folks, Monday, and here I am at the workshop not doing very much because it's going to be one of those broken up weeks this week but things will get done and things will get video. So the first thing I've come here to do is to have a look under my loot and back at all my metal tube with the idea of making the motor support and uh, counter shaft support for the Holbrook. Uh, and I've discovered luckily that virtually all the tube I've got is 48.4 mil, which is a standard handrail size so I need 48.4 mil fittings uh, so now I know what I want I can I can work out uh, a list and get them on order because I can't see any point in uh, in buying new pipe I could use probably a size smaller if I did but for the price of the fittings it doesn't really make that much difference so that's what I'm going to do next I'm going to get the uh, Get the camera shaft out from behind the lathe, get it on the hydraulic platform, get it up to working height and have a look at it and think. Because we need to uh, we need to have the counter shaft, I think, so that the pulley slides on the counter shaft so that we can line up the pulleys to get the different speeds. And also we need to have some method of breaking the drive between the motor and the counter shaft, or the counter shaft and the lathe, like a clutch or a what I'll probably put in is something that either lifts the motor to take the tension off the rebuild, uh, or something that uh, moves the counter shaft to take the tension off the belt between the lathe and the uh, counter shaft. So that's today's project. I'll crack on. There we have it folks. You can see that the, uh, the motor is pivoted so that the weight of the motor keeps the spelt in tension. But what I would be intending to do would be to mount the motor in such a way that you can lift this with a lever to take the belt out of tension and therefore turn off the drive to the lathe. Or, I think it would be, it's probably going to be easier to lift the motor uh, rather than disconnect the uh, lathe shaft from the, uh, from the lathe. Now on the original uh, Holbrook setup, there is actually a very beautiful clutch on this shaft between the pulley and the uh, and the actual pulleys that feed out to the lathe so, uh, with a lever control uh, that breaks the drive. Uh, it would also be nice to sort of mimic the Colchester action whereby you lift it up to start the machine, you press it down to disconnect the drive and you press it down hard for the brake. So it would be very nice to have a some sort of brake just to stop that pulley and that pulley looks to me like a really good size to put a brake on externally also I might I'm pretty sure that this has to slide like that in order to line up all the speeds uh, I'm gonna to have to get in touch with John Burke and have a chat about that I think because uh, he's the man he knows his stuff without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, but I can easily envisage a break on there. Uh, and also, uh, there, there looks to be, it's nice that this is a fender tape lock pulley, which means it'll be easy to get off. There looks to be enough shaft there to get the, uh, to get the slide along if necessary. I don't think I've got any shaft this size. I'm just uh, I'm just getting the calipers and go and have a look. See if I've got any.
inch and a quarter, 1.25, or 36 inches. No, 31. 31.9, it's 32. Yeah, 31 point, yeah, it's 32 mil. 32 mil or inch and a quarter. I have to uh, have a look on the tape lock bush and that'll tell me whether it's imperial or metric. But I haven't got any. So for now, we'll be either making do with this bit or what will get some more wood up if we haven't. If we ain't got any. Right. I think what I'll do next is take the motor off the uh, off this cradle. It looks alright just this cradle, but in actual fact it's all been bolted and screwed together, there's no welds on it. And as you move it around each of these joints flexes and uh, the whole thing is, is, is way, way dodgy. But the lathe was working with it though, I think the guy himself had made it up and the lathe was working with it on. So there you go. So it might not be brilliant but it was good enough. Right, I'll get on with it and bring you back. Right folks, taper lock made by Fenners in Hull. Tapered hub, tapered pulley, two Allen screws. The idea is that when you tighten those Allen screws up, it pulls the tapered pulley onto the tapered hub, which is split somewhere. You can't see it because of the paint, but it's split. And it tightens the whole thing up on the shaft. Right? To remove it, you remove the two Allen screws, give that a gentle tap, and then you put an Allen screw in there and tighten it up. And as you tighten it up, it forces the pulley back off the taper and off it comes or at least that's the theory let's see if it works in practice and there we are folks a brief tap with a copper hammer and it came loose I did put the allen screw in uh, and try it first but it tightened right up and very often they just need a little bit of a tap just to free them off this has been painted up of course but she's off good show and there she is off. Right. Next job I've got to do is clean off both ends of the shaft right up to the bearings. Slacken the Allen screws on the bearings, pull the bearings off. And then the delicate job of getting the cast iron pulley loose. Uh, I would have thought it would have had a sliding key in it. It's got an Allen screw in it, which I've already found. There may be two. Uh, but I'm going to have to look at that tomorrow because... I'm out of time for today and I've got other jobs to do. So see you all tomorrow. Bye now. Oh, you might have spotted I've got a tripod. So I'm hoping to up my game in the video stakes. See if I can be any better. Let's face it, I couldn't be much worse. Bye now. Morning folks, Tuesday. And I'm back on this again. And I've just noticed, when you're doing something like this, I know it's obvious, but before you start trying, clean all the shaft off, emery tape it off, get all the little lumps out of it, in which, on this, there are a few. Now I've got this ring loose, but I've noticed, when I first touched it, that it was partially loose, and it's been spinning, and it's left a ridge all the way around. So I'm going to take the ridge off with a file, and see if it will come off, because by the looks of it, it will. And if it isn't going to give me a battle, it's going to be a lot easier than I thought to strip this. After that, the only problem, of course, is this cast pulley, which doesn't appear, much to my surprise and annoyance, to have a key in it. Appear to me. There. 
which would appear to mean that we can't make it into a we can't make it into a slap pulley that slides on the keyway because there isn't a key inside the pulley unless I can cut a keyway in it which uh, I shall know more when I get it off so I shall continue not bodging and just like that it came off doddle there you go folks just shows how wrong you can be I've just tried to take the outer bearing off having slackened off the allen screws that hold the pulley and the pulley's actually loose on the shaft it's, it looks like it's got grease on it uh, so I'm going to move the pulley right back to uh, the bearing and then clean the shaft and uh, drop the pulley off the other way just shows how wrong you can be looking at the, uh, the shaft now I've got it out. I think it's had several previous uses. It's, uh, it's got a section on it and it's slightly reduced but it makes no difference. I might see if I can get hold of a new piece. But in the meantime we set up here with the chuck gripped on the inside of the pulley, the hollow inside of the pulley with a bull nose centering just as a safety precaution to hold it into the chuck. But this is by far the fastest way of getting the wrist on. But you do have to be careful and you do have to have your wits about you and you do have to have your hair in the sock and no wrist watches and no Rings, no fluffy sleeves. I'm still trying to work out. So trying to work out, this lathe is down as a 12 speed, including the back gears. So for each speed you select with the belts, the back gear gives you a different speed. So that means there must be eight pulley selections, which give, just gives you another four speeds for the back gear. I'm trying to work out how far this pulley has to slide. But it definitely has to slide, it definitely doesn't have a key in it, and it's got two Allen screws to lock it. And by the looks of the portion of the shaft that was under the pulley, which was greased, in order to change the speeds they've been slackening the two Allen screws and sliding the pulley along the, uh, along the shaft. 
which is what I may well continue to do. I was having a look last night on lathes.co.uk and on John Burke's photographs and I can't see any mechanism whereby you would move a lever to slide this pulley along. So I must, have, must conclude that it was, uh, that's how you did it. And this does look like the original pulley. It does seem like the same as the one in the pictures. It does line up. So there you go. Right, I'll crack on with this and uh, I'll bring you back when I've done it. There we go, folks. I've just turned it round. Get the back edge. I've put a wire bush inside there and i put a wire bush inside that end. And she's lovely and clean. In no time at all. Excellent. Right folks, a word about plumber blocks as they're called, or bearing blocks, or whatever you want to call them. Screw in the top here. You take the screw out, get a lever, rotate the bearing, find the two slots, and it comes out. So then you can give it all a nice clean up. Little hole here, can you see that? little hole, that's the grease hole. Around here is a slot that connects with this screw hole on the top. So you can take the locking screw out, put a grease nipple in, force grease into the bearing which will go straight through that little hole and down into the bearing. Then you take the grease nipple out, put the locking screw back in. Put it back together, line the slot up, Squeeze it round, put the locking screw back in. So the whole thing can be stripped down and cleaned. Luckily, these are very smooth and quiet. So all I'm going to do is grease them and leave them as they are. Right, I'll get on with the other one. Right, folks. I'm trying to get my head round the conundrum. Basically, basically, I'm trying to see if I've got enough shaft here to select all six speeds. Now this is a 12 speed lathe according to the great uh, lathes.co.uk site. This is 12 speeds and each speed has a back gear, right? So you've got a, like a like a low ratio for each speed. So we need to be able to select six speeds on the pulleys in order to have uh, the twelve full twelve speeds of the lathe. Now, if we just come over here, that's what it's supposed to look like. Right, this is what this is what I'm sort of trying to duplicate of a fashion, not perfectly, but just looking right, looking right and being able to have the lathe freestanding because most people just mount the counter shaft on a wall and uh, and put the lathe next to it. Well I want this lathe to be freestanding. So I need to make I need to check that that gap there is enough and in my estimation it isn't enough because it won't quite select all six speeds so if you imagine here zooms out a bit we've got one two three speeds right and then we shift the pulley one notch that way, one width that way, and we've got four, five. But if we shift it another notch that way, that gives us six. That works, doesn't it? That works. So you only need to be able to shift it two widths. So that's one, two, three, 
four, five, six. So there is enough shaft. There is enough shaft. I'm glad about that because <laughs> it's very, well it's not very expensive, but it's uh, it's like 30, 36 pounds a meter or something. Uh, but I'd have to, I'd, I'd shop around, that's the first price I saw. The, the first one frightened me, it was a hundred and odd pounds, but that was for, God knows, for three meters or something. I don't need three meters, but as you can see that this is this works beautifully. The bearings are fine, uh, so that looks like that's it. We only need to shift two widths, two pulley widths. So there's one, one, two, three, four, five. Move that right over to the small to small six. And then with the back gears, that makes 12. So that should do it. I think I've got that right. Well, we'll see. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to piece this together. Uh, and I'm going to have to have some method of tensioning the belt between these two, uh, which could mean mounting this on a pivoted plate, so that I can just lift it slightly. Or open it out slightly, uh, which will have the effect of shortening the length. I'm not sure about that, but I'm pretty sure. These pulleys seem to be the same size as those pulleys to a very close degree. They're not exactly the same. The pulleys are, of course, crowned. They're higher in the middle, so that the belt centres on the on the pulley and stays. It doesn't move to one side or the other. Right, so I'm going to have to make some method of of tightening those up. I think the strange thing is, although it's very difficult to tell from from a photograph, but there doesn't look to be any method of tensioning here. This is the uh, clutch. That's the clutch there. Right, that's uh, that's your in out lever for the clutch. Uh, <coughs> there doesn't appear to be any method of tensioning the belt there. Which would which would mean that the race the pulley Oh, I don't know. I'm beginning to get a headache now. <laughs> and the put is the pulley. Are the police could the police take the belt in every ratio. Take the same length belt in every ratio. My head hurts. Right. Anyway, time has come. The wall was said. I've begun. I've begun sketching uh, what it's going to look like. Basically. There's two mounting holes here and the same at the other end. There. Oh, there's only one at that end apparently. Oh no, there's two. So what I'm going to do is put a piece of tube between there which will give me a low down fixing. I'm going to fix to this T-slot here with two brackets. So there'll be two tubes come out there, two tubes come out there, a piece in between each of them, and then two uprights to whatever height I, I need to get the uh, to get the frame, the drive frame on. Then I have to make a drive frame, mount that on it, centre it all up, and uh, use these two Allen screws here to loosen off, to slide the pulley, to get the final speeds. So it's quite complex. And there's infinite, infinite areas that I can cock up. But never mind. Let's just charge on with it. Right, well that's it for today folks, because I've got to take my daughter to the obstacle in Bridlington to get an x-ray. Uh, so, I'll see you all tomorrow.
but tomorrow we're going to be at my friend Richard's uh, to fix his compressor. Okay, I'll bring you back. Bye now. Oh, well, you forgot it now. Here we are, folks. Yeah. At a location secret somewhere in Yorkshire. Yeah. And this is the compressor. It's a very good Ingersoll Rand 242 model and after a brief twiddle with an electrical fault which we cured very quickly we realized that there was something wrong with the unloader valve system now the unloader valve system is this here and this device here and there's a centrifugal pair of bob weights inside which push a pin into there and open a valve so when the tank fills up and the pressure switch switches the sw tank off, switches the pump off, it stops revolving, the bob weights push the pin through and it opens this pipe to atmosphere, actually into the crankcase and then back out to atmosphere. But for some reason when that happened it was discharging all the air from the tank back out through the, through the compressor and back out through there. And I looked at this device here, there's a, there's a pipe goes into there that goes into the tank. I looked at this and thought to myself, that's either two separate pipes or the non-return valve isn't working. And so we took the fittings off, took the pipe off and found this looked at it and it looked dodgy and there's no it was just like that when I took it out right so I said to Richard I think this is a non-return valve but all its bits are missing and he said where will they be I said well they'll be in the bottom of the tank so we took the mud holes out reached into the bottom of the tank which is full of crap and in the bottom of the tank was a disc, a spring and that bit and that disc is the valve and that drops into there and that clicks onto there and there's a ridge machine, there's a slot machined in there as you can probably see and that's supposed to locate over that ridge and it just taps on and it had all fallen to pieces with no non-return valve as soon as that opens, all the pressure in the tank is open to atmosphere and it all leaks back and blows to atmosphere. So it was a bit of logic deduction that there should be an unreturned valve but it wasn't working. So, what we're going to do now, or what Rich is going to do now, is get some solvent, some uh, grease solvent, rinse the inside of the tank out because it's filthy, it's absolutely thick with oil and crap and clean the inside of the tank out, put the mud holes back, back on and go to the compressor shop which is only just down the road and see if we can get a non-return valve and also a head gasket because we actually had a look at the reed valves as well and they're not in bad condition but there is a lot of rust and, uh, and dirt in the cylinder heads so they both want doing, they both want cleaning and servicing there's the reed valves there's the piston, you can see by that how much rust and muck there was in there. This is after we've cleaned a lot of it out. So there you go. So that was today. Unfortunately, like the prat that I am, <laughs> I forgot to film it. But never mind. Anyway, the job's done. It's five o'clock. I'm going home. Bye now. Morning folks, Friday and alternatively sunny and cloudy, very warm and very pleasant, can't complain. So, here it is, the what is it, the what is it.
Well, it's the model of a front end of a jet aircraft, obviously. It looks like it might have had wings. It looks like it might have had a rear part joined to it and made up a complete aircraft. But it's also got all these model rockets and missiles and bombs or whatever and nose cones I assume these are different nose cones now the strange thing about these is that this point you can see that one's slightly bent that's actually a tube and all these are actually very fine tubes as though there is perhaps an air pressure sensor that fits inside now there's a little panel there that comes off that's had something inside it and also the cockpit panel comes off and has had something mounted inside it electronic instruments we don't know right but this comes the all these came with it in this uh, in this little box here Now some of these are made out of uh, Paxilin-like material, synthetic resin bonded plastic, SRBP, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this one's made out of steel, right? But that also has a little tube through it. This one has no tube through it, that's Paxilin or whatever. That's Paxilin. And these these are very, very well made, very intricate and uh, beautifully made and heavy. Do element but heavy. Now we think, we think it's possibly a wind tunnel model, an XRF or looking at, I mean the, the blue on here is really, it's, uh, it's like a naval blue, it's not like an RAF blue but who knows? Now some of the missiles have names on the bottom uh, and some of them are American. Let me see if I can find you one. I should have put it to one side, shouldn't I? What a silly boy I am. That's not that. It's one of these. I'm pretty sure it's one of these. It has something written on the bottom of it. No. Anyway, it gives you a chance to get a close look at them, doesn't it? There we are. This is the Amram ADF 53401, it looks like. So there you are. And we really want to know if we're right, if it is an air tunnel model, a wind tunnel model, and where it came from. Possibly British Aerospace at Bruff, we're not sure. As you can see, some of it is taking damage. But uh, it's just an interesting thing. So there you are. Anybody out there that knows, you've now had a much closer look at it and a much closer look at all its accessories this uh, who knows what this is it's a steel pipe with aluminium pressed in inserts in the end I'm only saying they're aluminium because of the colour right that's just a fin off one of the uh, one of the missiles this appears to fit in there also fits in one of the other ones there's also that one which is loose which comes out and that one fits in here but what's the purpose are these fine tubes for reading the air pressure or the air build up pressure in front of the nose as, as it zooms into the uh, into the air I don't know also, strangely, this has a locating pin on it. 
and if you look at the holes there's a hole there that hole looks like it's spurious because it doesn't fit the pin doesn't fit in that hole but it fits in that hole and when it goes in it puts these two veins off center it puts them slightly skewed like that but certainly these these pieces are beautifully made they really are well made right if anybody knows if anybody's got an idea If anybody's worked with anything like this, or there's still a lot of people about from British Aerospace at Bruff, which is not too far away. This was this was purchased at York Car Boot Sale. So there you go. So if anybody knows anything about it, please let us know in the comments. Right? It would be very interesting to know more about it. It belongs to my friend Andy, the antique dealer. He bought it on a whim and probably, as antique dealers tend to do, paid far too much for it. Right, I'll bring you back when I'm doing something more interesting. Bye now. Well folks, it's Friday, it's that time again. And uh, I've just rebuilt this vacuum cleaner and forgot to bloody film it. So there you go. I get so into what I'm doing that I think I'll stop in a minute and film it. And before I know it, it's all back together and I've done it. What an idiot. Right, there you go. So a rebuilt vacuum cleaner. We now have a wet and dry vacuum cleaner for the workshop, which I've wanted for a long time, so that I can clean. I use it for lathes. Just go straight across the lathe bed, get all the chippings up. Right, and I've also got another one out. Split my thumb open with it and then chucked it away because it was knackered. So, if you've got any ideas, let me know. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. Still, 70-80% of the people who view my videos aren't subscribed. a wonderful workshop it's so tidy and I'll see you all next week for more fun and games next week if the weather's fine I'm going to do some tractoring to cut the uh, cut the nettles and thistles down and get it back to grass again so I'll see you then bye now